Hey everybody, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough with a different kind of video. Today I am going to be going over a game that I am working on creating in the background. So ever since my, my hero, Vince Ventrella, has created Rain in Hell, a fantastic game that him and Adam Loper have done together, uh, I have gotten the itch for miniature agnostic games. And in a big way, things like One Page Rules, obviously Rain in Hell is a lot of fun as well. Um, and I had a vision for one that I wanted to create, and so I wanted to talk about where I'm starting now in the process of this this particular video blog and what I want to do in the future. So as far as where I'm starting, there actually is a uh, Google Doc in the description below. This is going to be Game Doc. I haven't put it up there yet, but 1.1, where it's just a collection of rules and concepts that I've been working on in the background. And we're going to go through this document here in a little bit. But really, the point of this series is to show the back end of game design as I learn it myself. So I am not speaking as an authority. I am just a dude with an idea, right? Uh, as, as many of us are. And there's a very specific purpose to this, and that is whenever Games Workshop releases a new book, right? Any game company releases anything, to be perfectly honest, but Games Workshop's obviously in my universe, uh, what I hear the most about. Uh, there you get a whole bunch of like armchair generals being like, well, you should have done this. Well, obviously Games Workshop, you missed the whole boat. This is the answer. A lot of, lot of uh, Monday night quarterbacks, so to speak. And so rather than just being another voice, I wanted to learn more about making games and you learn to do by doing. So I wanted to learn more about that industry by just jumping in for myself, seeing how hard it is, right? What does it look like on the other side of the camera of like trying to create rules and then people go and grab all over them. So that's the point of this whole journey is just sharing that experience as I learn what is actually very difficult uh, and all the glaring, you know, oversights that are up there that I just don't see because I don't think the same way as other people. I want to learn all that. And to aid me in that endeavor, I have three resources that I've been working with. Uh, the first one is called the White Box. It is a prototyping kit that you can get pretty much at any game store. It's just to help you uh, come up with the ideas for a board game mostly, but it does work for miniature games as well well as a bunch of little like prototyping bits in there uh, dice everything you'd need really and then a collection of essays about game design in general that are very very helpful next up is the game makers journal i found this on amazon and uh, this rather than uh, being a prototyping kit this is more of a a workbook to help you organize your thoughts and i do find that very useful for me particularly i get a little scatterbrained it's easy for me to kind of wax poetic on different ideas but not putting them together kind of a thing is is kind of where I fall short. So having to write them down and build these things into little blocks and chunks is very, very helpful. So that's been a good aid. And then the last one is, uh, what is it? Tabletop War Games by Rick Priestley and John Lampshed. And this is more or less um, a couple of industry giants who've been in gaming for forever, very influential in wargaming space, uh, sat and just put all their thoughts about game design and rule books and stuff into one little book. So um Basically what I'm doing is prototyping and testing ideas, defining them and cataloging them in the journal, and then refining them with uh, insight from people who have been doing war games for a lot longer than that's the concept. So that's that's the idea of the vlog. So I'm going to be sharing updates on those books and that prototyping and that kind of thing as I go. So if you're interested, stay tuned in. Well, let's talk about my game. OK, this is where I've gotten uh, lore wise. Okay, it's very, very simple. It's like I said, it's a miniature agnostic, so there's not a ton of things for you to sink your teeth into as of yet, because I want to leave open space for you to tell your story. Uh, but essentially, it's set in the town of Perdition, a once thriving, it had a different name before, but a once thriving megalopolis in the Wild West that was centered around the world's largest gold mine, not gold mine, uh, coal mine. C-O-A-L, coal. That was set kind of in the in the Midwest kind of area. Think like Deadwood, that kind of deal. Instead of mining other things, it's coal. They built a huge superstructure, kind of like the um, imagining that I'm going with is Chicago before the Great Chicago Fire, right? Where it's just a lot of wooden homes that are built outward rather than up because there's not enough literal infrastructure to build upward. One tragic day, the miners went too deep and ignited a small fire down below. The entire town has... Kind Kind of this massive super heated oven underneath it think things like silent hill there's also towns in pennsylvania in our real world that had coal fires underneath them and so the earth breaks apart and there's just like gouts of flame or smoke billowing up the entire place became covered in a thick ashen twilight that blocked out most of the sun and when they did that they opened a rift into hell itself and so now it has a hellish environment although the buildings and that kind of stuff it's all still there it just looks kind of rusted out 
out and, and kind of falling apart because of all this ash storm that's going on. There's demons crawling around. At the same time, the coal that was in the ground at the time of this explosion or eruption has been somehow irradiated with so much energy that it works about a thousand times more effectively than normal coal. And so this means we're using coal technology to power things that coal could never power. So automata, robots, that kind of thing, because there's enough power. So normally, you know, it would take a grain of sand's worth of this new blood coal, we'll call it, from the mines here um, is an equivalent to like tens of thousands of tons of actual normal coal. So this is how we're getting our steampunk thing going on. Uh, everybody wants this power source. It's a huge gold mine of power uh, and industry and that kind of stuff. And of course, it's in this town that's all infected. It's all, I mean, if you're thinking, whoa, that sounds like Warpstone in Mordheim. Yeah, thumbs up. You're a genius. You made a connection. But that's the basic idea, right? And, and, and that's perfect for these kinds of miniature agnostic games. We have a setting where there's motivation for people to enter, but it's also rife with danger and MacGuffins as to why people would want to go there. What are they after? It's the most basic elements of storytelling. I'm going to be doing a lot more of fleshing things out. For example, who was the mayor, who was the mine operator, um, the various companies trying to descend on this place can shape the various warbands as well as, of course, the demons and, and the people who are haunted and twisted by living in that place like religious cults that went insane because of this change, um, uh, the other stuff like that. So that's the lore side of things. Let's move into the actual rules, okay? Now, as per the, the Game Maker's Journal, they instruct you to basically start out by listing off some of the core mechanics that you would like to introduce. The core one that I started with is right here, and this is using a deck of cards instead of dice to determine random numbers. Now, I have been told that Mordheim, uh, not Mordheim, <laughs> Malifaux, does a similar thing. Each player has their own deck of cards. I'm gonna say this up front, I've never played Malifaux. I know of the game, I'm not like oblivious to it, and I know it uses a deck of cards. However, this is actually much more based in Fallout Wasteland Warfare than anything else, and I'll explain in a minute. So instead of using uh, your own deck of cards, you and your opponent, you're going to share a deck, which opens up a lot more in conditions for card counting and that kind of stuff. I think personally, I think it you know, you're just going to reshuffle when it's all used up. But I do think it has a meaningful impact to have to share a deck with an opponent. Now, here's the part that comes from Fallout Wasteland Warfare. And that is, in, in that game, you roll a die and it has a number. And that's how you tell if you've achieved your, you know, your test, your skill test or not. In addition, you're rolling other dice that have symbols all over. These symbols coordinate to special effects that some weapons may have. So a gun might have, uh, in our example here, uh, we would say um, if a club or a spade is drawn regardless of the number you know it's going to do fire damage if it succeeds so if the number is a success meaning it hits the thing then it triggers the special effect if it is a club or a spade and the target goes on the on fire we could also rewrite that same thing to be number based so if it's an eight or higher meaning eights nines tens and all the face cards would would equal fire damage. Another way to, to do this is make it an and if statement. If it's a four up and it's a diamond, which is its own specific, you know, set of values, then it's fire damage. And, and again, where I'm just illustrating the various ways of calculating the odds of things. And then if it's a face card down here, it's fire. So these are just four types of fire damage, but different ways of articulating how weapons can do them. And each one of these has its own statistical probability in a given deck. One of the things in Warcry that I really like is having variable damage profiles. So uh, up here at the top, what I've initially done is you flip the damage card. And if it's a spade or a club, you use the leftmost profile. So in this case, two points of damage. If it's a heart or a diamond, it does the more intense, whatever that is. So more critical type things. In this case, three damage. I'm just thinking of like a normal pistol or something like that. So you flip the card. What's the suit? The suit will determine the damage thing. And if that suit, if the weapon rather, has any special effects like this, those things can be calculated at that point too. What this gives us is a really simple way to count target numbers, right? What are you trying to achieve? So let's say my attack stat plus the card that I draw. Is that a success or not? If it's successful, are there any other modifiers like say the fire damage or whatever? Does the suit matter? Does blah, 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 all those kinds of things. So that's how you're calculating all the variable uh, variabilities, rather success or special effects via the card deck. And I actually went on quite a bender and did a whole bunch of maths on table and, uh, and worked out the odds of drawing any particular thing, whether that's, you know, a face card, a certain number or higher and how that all works. So I'm getting some, some reasonable numbers. I'm still working on this. 
this is a work in progress. If you see any glaring errors, please let me know. Uh, essentially, what I want to do is go through this and just create a few basic characters and then refine it. I want to have like an, a set of averages, right? What's an average profile doing average damage? And then we can start tweaking, okay, this guy is better at attack, but worse at defense and vice versa. Looking back at our game doc, that's really all I've done. Um, there's other things down here, like a set of statistics for fighters and stuff like that. To be honest, this is largely filler. This is, you know, gen insert generic war game <laughs> where there's not a lot of stats. Um, you know, what's movement? Move a model that number of inches, that kind of thing. Um, I do have a few other concepts in here that I'm going to be revisiting. For example, the order phase, I want to cut this entire thing out. But that's, you know, as far as the Game Maker's Journal goes, this is really what I've been working on, is, is formulating a way to articulate the rules for how tests work. There's a test to see if you have the value to succeed at what you're doing, as well as modifiers for special things like this. Now, one of the things I also want to include, it's not listed here, here is I want each scenario to have special effects. So like my thought is, uh, for example, aces will always be scenario specific effects. So aces would be a 10 plus in addition to when you play this in a given scenario, maybe it gives a certain bonus to defenders rather than attackers kind of a deal. And all of those would be listed in the mission itself. Not too dissimilar from how if you play Age of Sigmar, um, certain battle plans give you certain command abilities or command traits or something like that, the mission specific ones. So that's exactly what I'm looking at doing there. And I want to use this as a repository to build up a whole bunch of unique weapons. So think something like, um, oh, I guess sort of like Mordheim or Stargrave or Frostgrave, where there's like, you know, kind of like a good armory that you can choose from but the weapons are not ridiculous it's not like in horus heresy where there's a thousand different kinds of bolters i just want to have a few different options to be frank i'm really looking at like the weapon choices from red dead redemption 2 as a blueprint just a few different kinds of pistols a few different kinds of rifles here and there and some other things. Now there are other rules listed here, but I'm still kind of pruning out these ideas. Like I said, this is very much a, a very basic generic type of war game, explaining actions and stuff like that. And so this is this is really the, the point of this video is just as a starting place. I'm gonna go back and let's start working on this going forward. Here I have the attack sequence listed out of, you know, you make an attack test, you have your card value, meaning what you flipped plus your model's power. There's gonna be modifiers based on things like the suit or face that's drawn. Uh, if the total is greater than the defender's defense value, the attack is successful. The next thing you do is flip another card. This is going to determine your damage and that's gonna say whether it's a hit or crit and then you use any of the special abilities here from the weapon profile uh, to determine special effects. Fire rounds for example and then you allocate damage. So I'm gonna be throwing more ideas there but it's the it's the basic outlines. So let's talk about a few ideas I have going forward and then chat about what my goal for the next video in this series is going to be. So as far as ideas go, here's the next one that I have. I want to get more of that sweet, sweet Wild West feel, right? That iconic, you're playing a game in a saloon style feel. So we have the card deck for that and I like it quite a bit, but I wanted to do more. And so here's my idea that I'm going to try writing into words, uh, rules language rather, uh, for next time. And that is, at the start of your round, you count up how many models from your warband are left, and you get two poker chips for each one of them. So if I have four guys, eight chips, I might even throw in a thing that if your leader's alive, you get an extra one, something like that. Then in the initiative phase, right at the start there, before anyone starts activating a model, you then assign actions, these poker chips, to each of your models to a maximum of three. Each chip represents an action they can take. So you could spread them out evenly. Everybody gets two and you can all do two actions as normal like in Warcry. Or you can put up to three on any given character and they can do more actions there. This would require me to reformat the actions list to basically say how many of those poker chips they require to do. I really just want to keep it to one or two. I don't want to have anything crazy for, for having three poker chips necessarily. Um, but the point is much like you allocate focus at the beginning of the turn in War Machine, this is you allocating, okay, I have so many actions, where do I need them to be? And you and I as players are betting on our characters, betting, again, it's like a game at the saloon, we're wagering that this character can perform these things given these resources, i.e. action tokens represented by poker chips. I think that could be cool. I think there's a few things that come to mind immediately when I have that idea is like, is there a minimum? Do you have to give everybody one, which I'm not really a fan of, or is there a maximum 
my heart says three. Because with three, you could do something like reload, aim, and fire, right? That would be like three actions. Or you could do a long action, like, you know, charge would be two. Uh, and then another third one on top of that. Just stuff like that. But I think it would be a cool way to, to illustrate the gambling aspect. I'm betting on this character to perform their tasks. And in a sense, you're also betting on the card draw as well, much like you would do in poker, right? I am bet that the cards that I draw to complete these actions will be successful. What I don't want is for someone to stack all of their actions on one character that they invested a ton of points in and they're just amazing and they sweep the field, right? I don't, I don't want a Rambo. I want a team to have to work, but I like the idea of having to allocate resources throughout that team. So that's, that's my concept that I'll be working on. If you have any ideas on how to modify that or turn it into rules language, I would love to hear it. As far as what I want to do by the next time that I do one of these videos, with what I have, I think I have enough um, to start rough prototyping. So that I means I'm just gonna take some like index cards, write out some basic fighter profiles, uh, have a good guy and a bad guy. The good guy is a little more defensive, a little less offensive, and the bad guy is a little more offensive and a little less defensive, right? Kind of get those averages working, create some basic fighters, and then like three or four really, really simple weapons. Now, one thing that does matter if you are going to be helping with this and you're interested is the table. I want to keep it to a 36 by 36 max. That's just a priority for me because it's the kind of game anyone can play on their kitchen table for the most part. Uh, we could even go two by two, but I want it to be something like that. Very accessible for people. Once I have some stats made up for characters, then I can begin testing my idea for action economy, which is really what it is. That poker chip idea of, you know, each chip is representative of one action, and then you allocate those points. It's action economy, but it also favors having more and more troops. So then am I going to put a premium on fighters? Do I put a cap on the number of fighters you can have in your war band? That kind of stuff. It gets really, really murky when you start having to make those kinds of decisions. So. I'm going to be kind of thinking about that and see how it goes. Um, I also want to get a sense of like, how many fighters do I want each faction to have? And that's an open question for you guys. How many fighters do you like to have in a war band? When I play Necromunda, it usually ends up being seven to eight, I think, something like that with my Escher girls back when I played. Whereas, um, you know, something like the, whatever the cops are in that game, I can't remember, Palanite forces or something. They're five dudes, right? They're like four, maybe five guys. And so that would be a different thing. Do you think I should cap it at a certain number? I mean, most games do, but I don't know. It's just an interesting debate. But it also opens up a lot of possibilities because then I could do things like denying action points or, you know, having fear conditions on a character that denies their ability to receive action points or at least hinders it a bit. Um, I think it'd be really cool. So I will end it there. I have some work to do, some homework, if you will. Uh, if you want to check out any of those resources, I do have links to them down below. Now I'm going to be honest, they are affiliate links. They go a long way to supporting the channel. But they are things that I'm going to be using and I stand by them, so I don't feel any shillness about it. Uh, I will be honest with you, the, um, what is it, Tabletop War Games by Rick Priestley is an awesome resource, so I do recommend checking that out regardless. He was influential in so many of the most popular miniature games that are out today, um, and, and truly iconic ones, so he's a cool dude. If you're interested in chatting about this more, head over to my Discord, which is also in the description down below, and we'll have a discourse there. You can reach me at my 2 Plus Tough Feedback One uh, channel, rather, and uh, we'll chat it out there. Thank you so much for watching, and happy wargaming.